Welcome back to Autism Live. Joining us via Skype is Rob Bear. He uh, is an amazing gentleman who is speaking out about autism in the corporate world, and there's nobody who would know more about this because he got a late in life diagnosis after having worked in the corporate world for many, many years as a software engineer. So it's all a little fascinating. Rob, we want to welcome you to the show, and, and thank you for taking the time to be with us. Well, thank you, Shannon. It's great to be here. I, I appreciate your show and the work that you do very much and the opportunity to speak to your audience. Well, and likewise, I appreciate that you're a bit of a, a man on a mission to share information and knowledge from an insider's point of view, uh, an insider in the corporate world, but an insider as somebody who got a diagnosis. But your diagnosis came relatively late in life. I'm curious, Rob, what were the things that made you question whether you needed to go and get a diagnosis. What were the red flags for you? Well, uh, to begin with, as, uh, as a young kid, around two years old, I noticed that I was not fitting in with other kids. Um, I was at a daycare center. I didn't fit in with the kids, and it was mostly because of the dynamics of the people at the daycare center. Uh, they would pick me up, take me over, and set me <laughs> away from the other kids because they observed I wasn't interacting with them a whole bunch. So they'd kind of put me off by myself and keep an eye on me. I'm not sure why they did that um, other than, again, autistic people for some individuals are a management challenge because their intuition doesn't work. Later in life, um, uh, I made a friend who was a psychiatrist, a really nice guy, um, we were ham radio operators, we talked on the radio, we got together for coffee, had dinner together. Now that was back, I started hanging around with him in 1983, and uh, then I moved out of my hometown ba back in about 1997, and so we didn't have a lot of direct contact after that. He said that he believed that I might be part of this unusual neurological group that was kind of like autistic and kind of like Asperger's, but we didn't have, I didn't have enough disability to be considered diagnostically significant. So we had lots of talks about it. He gave me a specialized intelligence test for creative and analytical problem solvers. I did well on that. Um, but he, I never saw him professionally. We were just buddies and we hung around together. Uh, then, in 2012, I was dating a girl who, uh, who always complained that I was lacking passion, and, and one day she became angered at me and uh, said, uh, I read a book about Bill Gates. It says he has Asperger's syndrome. I think you have Asperger's syndrome. You better see a doctor. She walked out of my house, and I never saw her again. <laughs> wow. So, so like, uh, uh, I happened to be sitting at my computer when she said that. So I looked up uh, autism, Asperger's syndrome, then found out about autism and uh, read up on it. And I thought, this is interesting. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll have to come back to this and look at it. About a month later, I did. And uh, to tell the truth, it was a great feeling, understanding, and I, I'm an analytical type. It was data to me, uh, not on emotional data, but I looked at the logical part first, and I went, aha, I know what's going on. You know, it's kind of like an engine. If it's not running right, as soon as you find out what's making it not run right, that's good, good data you can work with. Well, then when I started reading the stories of autistic people, I, I realized that there were a lot of people out there like me, and... A lot of them were having similar experiences. Most of them were not getting their lives started, and if they did, they were miserable. Um, so I, I kept reading, and eventually I started reaching out to people to say, how can I help? Because I was horrified by the stories, just horrified. It was gut-wrenching. It was very similar to the feeling you get when, you when you've walked out of Schindler's List. I just had this gut, uh, almost putrid feeling. So 
then I ended up connecting with a guy who was teaching one of those uh, uh, classes in, in um, uh, software testing to a bunch of autistic college students, made some more connections, ended up in a research program, and uh, there I was professionally evaluated as the intake into the research program. And I've been in three studies now, and I'm going to start a fourth one next Wednesday where they look at adults, especially older adults, and uh, uh, various levels of functioning and look at, like, for inst instance, aging, coping skills, et cetera. But that's the story of how I, I discovered and I'm autistic and actually got a diagnosis. Amazing. And I'm curious because a lot of people write in I'm, I'm just going to be honest, and they'll say, you know, I think it's possible that I'm on the spectrum, or I think this person that I care about very much is on the spectrum, but is, <clears throat> is it worthwhile, is always the question, is it worth the trouble to go get the diagnosis and the expense? It, it, well, the thing that they ask me, and I don't know, so I, want, I, I couldn't wait to ask you is, did your life change because of the diagnosis in a really substantive way? Was it worth it finding out, ah, that's what it is? Uh, to me personally, yeah, it was tremendously uh, helpful, and it did redirect my life in that uh, I walked away from software engineering, and I'm n now uh, – ramping up as an advocate for people like me now. Being an advocate, being an autistic person, um, advocating other autistic people is a challenge because, uh, believe it or not, autistic people have very little credibility, generally speaking, in the uh, among autism professionals. They really don't want to include us that much uh, as mentors or in any other capacity. Um, what was the question again? I'm sorry. I the question, <laughs> has your life changed as a result? And I think you are answering the question is, yeah. you know, I think there are people watching who are like, yeah, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I probably have some of these features too, but what happens after you get the diagnosis that makes it worthwhile? So knowing that these well, that, things about that, yourself. For me, that was it. And for, I'm for sorry, other people, I think the uh, data might be very, very valuable for them, just the information to work with. Uh, however, when walking into uh, a diagnosis, I would be very careful to be aware of the stigmas associated with autism and that they are, in fact, stigmas. And so that if you do get a positive diagnosis, they do confirm that you're autistic that you understand the context of the diagnosis because a uh, diagnosis can be psychologically devastating as I think you, your question essentially dances around the fact that, that uh, 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 a diagnosis without proper preparation uh, can be psychologically devastating and limiting to the autistic person. Yeah, I, I think so. And that, I think that's one of the things that people weigh when, and they ask us the question, and I just don't feel informed enough to answer it. Uh, but, you know, what's it, it how is it going to be good for me? Because there is a little bit of a stigma attached that isn't necessarily appropriate. Um, so it's good to well, hear that it, it meant good things for you. It did. And it also opens up options because today, while autism is treated entirely as a, a disability, and when we run into issues in workplaces, school, et cetera, it, it's treated as a socialization issue attributable to the autism, per, the person who is autistic. Uh, the reality is, uh, similar to what was done with women in workplaces and schools, is it's best to model it as a cultural difference. At the point where it is being substantially modeled as a cultural difference, um, we're going to have a little bit better acceptance in workplaces and schools. Uh, and, and that actually, I'm getting a little bit of, ahead of the questions now, but the, one of the key issues I've realized in, in uh, being an autistic student 
And I did end up with a bachelor degree and a master degree in computer science. I got through school. Now, I was functionally illiterate till I was 23 years old due to learning disabilities. Is a lot of the communication that happens in corporate worlds is nonverbal. A lot of managers, a lot of teachers uh, use nonverbal reinforcements and they read their students or their workers using nonverbal communication. Uh, initially, if you think back to the old days, 1955 is, is often used as the height of the chauvinist era in businesses. Um, men couldn't relate to women. Well, human resources, departments, schools, etc., found ways to get around that, and it, it's worked very, very well. Uh, if those some, same methods and attitudes are applied to what are now called socialization issues of autism, all of a sudden those problems will functionally evaporate. Now, I, this is all so fascinating to me, Rob, because uh, to say that you were functionally illiterate until you were 23, and yet you you were successful at getting jobs and holding on to jobs and becoming a software engineer. And all of these things were happening that all this nonverbal communication, how did you navigate all this? How were you still successful? Uh, it's a, there's actually a pretty simple answer. The implementation can be a little complex, but I always stuck to facts and logic. Um, and uh, by doing that, I always had something factually to show. Uh, very often, instructors didn't like me because I appeared to be an inattentive student. Um, also, a lot of teaching is nonverbal. The teacher lets you know nonverbally when you know enough to pass the test and stop asking questions. <laughs> <laughs> um, and we autistic people don't get that. They don't get that. Uh, teaching is actually when you, and you were a teacher, I believe, at one yes. time, weren't you? Yes. Okay. And teachers very often want the connection with students. That's where they feel the real talent in teaching is, is connecting with the students. It's hard for a teacher to connect with someone like me. On top of that, again, uh, teaching is essentially you learn enough to pass the test. That's not all it is, but... It really is. And what is necessary to pass a test? What is necessary to, okay, stop paying attention to this area and move on to another one is, is expressed non-verbally by the teacher when they're in front of the class. And there are so many other things that are done. And we just don't, don't get it. We don't understand it. We can't connect. The current teaching paradigm actually can't work for us very well. And so you're speaking out now, and you've become an advocate. Um, and, and what advice is it that you want to give to all of us so that we can bridge this gap? Because there are more and more people identified as being on the autism spectrum. There are more and more um, need, I mean, true, true need for us to include these individuals in the corporate world because they bring skills, but this, this social thing, this bumps, what's the advice to those of us on the neurotypical side so that we can make this a better situation for people on the autism spectrum? You know what, that is an absolutely brilliant question. Um, and I know it's an obvious question, but I can't tell you how glad uh, I am you asked. Um, it's, it comes down to uh, current management dynamics. Uh, have you ever heard the term people manager and the person who is a people manager says, I don't need to know what my people are doing. I, uh, I don't need to know how they do what they're doing because I know how to manage people. Have you ever heard that? I have heard that. You hear it a lot. Yeah. Now, what they're doing is they are actually managing by nonverbal cues. When I show up in a manager's office and the, off and the manager asks me, Rob, how are you doing on your project? And I say, fine, everything's going well, come look at it. They don't want to look at it because they don't understand what I'm doing and it means nothing to them. And they have no way to look at what I'm doing and sense that there's progress. 
they are depending on the nonverbal communication so that when I say everything is doing fine, they can judge that either I'm telling them the truth or I'm not telling them the truth. That is one of the key points of corporate and e even school dynamics is that this nonverbal communication is used as a way for those people to manage other people when they don't know what they're doing or how they do what they do. So what um, should we be doing instead? Well, think about, uh, and this is an easy answer. You're going to be surprised by how easy this is. Think about the old days of chauvinism in businesses. Men could not relate to women very often in a workplace. Women were inexperienced with being in a workplace and workplace dynamics, and it just didn't work until somebody came along and said, okay, it's time for an attitude change, and guess what? It's not the problem with the women. It's not the woman's tone of voice that sounds wimpy. It's the problem with the current management, the way things are managed. So in the area of men dealing with women, uh, men were just simply told, shape up and listen to what a woman says. Don't listen to the way she's saying it. Don't look at her cleavage. Uh, don't look at whether she has big hair or not. Listen to what she's saying, and if you aren't competent in understanding what she says, you are not competent as a manager. Uh, so this is actually, and I know this is going to uh, come as a surprise to you and your listeners, uh, acceptability of autistic people in workplaces for many of us can be as simple as implementing the same paradigm that was used for including women in those workplaces. It's very interesting. I'm going to have to roll that around a little and see how that, um, it's very interesting. Because I have the opportunity in my life to be working with individuals who are on the autism spectrum. And I want the situations to work as much as anybody could because I have a son who's on the spectrum and I want him to inherit a world in which people are excited about what he brings to the table when he comes to his job because he's got mad skills. So I want to walk that talk. So I'm going to I'm going to take that for a spin and get back to you Rob and see how that works for me. I'm not used to thinking of things okay. from the point of view of a, of a male chauvinist pig, but I'll try it on and see if I can uh, you know well, what I'll, I mean? I'll give you I'll give you an easy method that, I, that, I, that I'm including in the book that I'm writing. And that is, today we have the autism spectrum disorder, and as part of that, we, you know, the world automatically, when something happens with an autistic person, they attribute it to a socialization issue. And they attribute all these things that need to be cured rather than accepted and dealt with. Uh, uh, what I contend is that that's very similar to a hypothetical woman spectrum disorder. And if you look back again to the 50s, generally centered around 1955, being a woman was treated as being a disability. Uh, being a woman uh, who walked into a workplace and all of a sudden there were issues with the men, she was the socialization issue. And the way of treating it was simply keep women out until women can somehow overcome these issues. Um, uh, the HR industry found a great way to take care of that, and that is they said, well, we're not going to sit around and wait until somebody answers the question, question, chicken or egg. All these eggs are coming in, and we are going to be looking more at the people who object to women and can't work with women, then we are going to look at the women and say, essentially, we need to cure women of the characteristics of being a woman. Absolutely. I, I totally get what you're saying, and I think it's amazing. Rob, we're almost out of time. Where can people get more information about you? Do you have a website so that when your book comes out, they'll know where to go? Well, the website is currently down. It's robbear.com, R-O-B-B-E-H-R.com. Uh, that should be up in about 30 days. So if your users want to go out, save it, and, uh, and to come back later, that would be great. 
Uh, my book, I think, will be a great resource if you find the theories that I've just presented uh, to be reasonable and interesting. However, uh, the book makes uh, an appeal to common sense. I give new perspectives on things, kind of the same way that a woman's advocate gave new perspectives on women uh, from, you know, about 1945 forward, which is really the age of, of new feminism. Uh, I, the best resource people have is their own brain. Think about what I've said, think it through, see how reasonable that is. Um, you know, it, it's... Uh, a human brain is a great resource. Common sense is excellent. Metaphors use great. Just think through the history of the women's movement, the challenges women have had, the challenges autistic people currently have, and look side by side and see is, is a difference really should it be modeled as a disability or should it be modeled as a cultural difference? And if the cultural difference can be worked around by simply listening to what somebody says and managers and coworkers being competent enough to, to understand their job and make decisions, you've covered most of the issues I've had in my life and many autistic people have had in their life. Obviously, there are people with comorbid morbid conditions and true severe disability. But there are an awful lot of us out there uh, who are really, if we were modeled differently, if the attitude were different, the problems with autism would disappear. Well, I think that's a very inspirational message, and we thank you so much for being with us. And give us the website again so that in 30 days people will know where to find you. Okay. Uh, it is Rob Bear, my name, R-O-B-B-E-H-R.com. And Shannon, thank you very much for having me. I really appreciate your show and your open-mindedness uh, to looking at all of the different theories, all of the, the different angles, uh, because to be honest, um, most of the autism professionals that I've tried to describe these things to, uh, they aren't bad people, but they are very stuck in the stereotypes, so they attempt to correct my perceptions. Wow. rather than listening to what I have to say. Well, that's that's not going to work, and they need to realize that, right? Uh, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I'll close with this because I know time is getting short. One of the huge problems with the autism industry is they don't include us, the very high-level autistic people, in their professional positions or in evaluating the issues facing autistics and how to how to handle those issues. Um, it's very similar to the old boys club, where okay, you need to deal with bringing women into a business, so let's get the guys together and discuss it. And when women ask to show up, they are kind of intuitively dismissed as not understanding the issues of business and workplace dynamics. We are being intuitively dismissed uh, the same way. I regret to say that, but that's what's happened. Well, and I regret that that is the case, and I know that that is the case in a lot of places. I think we're finding more and more places that don't feel that way, and I think that's where we all have to move um, yeah. is to that. I mean, I, I, honestly, as a parent, I can't imagine any other direction than, than going in that direction. So I thank you for your advocacy. I thank you for the mission that you're on, and thank you for being with us here today, Rob.